Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Richard Muller, who is a professor of physics at UC Berkeley, also the author of a lot of amazing books. Um, the most recent one is this one called Now the Physics of Time. Uh, and then you've got these other ones, The Physics for Future Presidents and Energy for Future Presidents, which um, I guess the, the title of those books was inspired by the class that you taught here at Berkeley to the undergrads, which was called Physics for I guess it was just physics for poets. Or, and then you realize, hey, wait a second, there might be some future presidents in here. So we're going to call it fu- physics for, for future uh, presidents. Uh, welcome, Richard. Oh, very, very glad to be here. Now, like I did mention that these books were aimed at a general audience. The, the physics of time is... Um, it's it's a little tougher. <laughs> so I, my, I have to admit that my mind was, and I studied physics briefly. My first um, my first uh, education was in astrophysics, and I very quickly realized that I needed to move over to the social sciences. But you um, quoted, I think it was C. P. Snow in in one of these books, and he's famous for the the book on the two cultures, the talk on the two cultures. And and he talks about how all of these people in the humanities bemoan the fact that um, educated people, ordinary educated people, people who claim to be highly educated may not have any familiarity with Shakespeare. And they say, if you're a humanist, this is impossible. You can't call yourself educated if you don't know Shakespeare. I certainly, as an economist, would say, you know, if you don't know anything about supply and demand, then you can't walk around calling yourself an educated person. And we ought to keep you away from <laughs> the levers of of, of power. Um, and, uh, and and I think it was, C, was it C.P. Snow who said, or was it um, Eddington? So one of these guys said, if you don't know the second law of thermodynamics, well, then how can you possibly call yourself <laughs> educated? And I'm sure you go to faculty meetings and the faculty senate meetings where uh, I guess the majority of the people there don't know what the second law of thermodynamics is. And yet we can kind of, I mean, we can flush a toilet without knowing how a toilet works. Why why do we need to know physics as non-physics people? Oh, well, the reason is very simple. C.P. Snow is wrong. I mean, I quote him, and I think uh, learning physics gives you a power a uh, an ability that is really important. Uh, but there's so many other things that you need. And as I go around the world, as I was in Korea two weeks ago, uh, uh, as I meet other people in the business world, the fact is uh, physics isn't really that important. Uh, in, in what I'm doing right now, which is... Um, creating a nuclear reactor that is going to transform the world. I really believe this, really excited by it. Um, and couldn't do it without physics. But if you are trying to find peace in the Mideast, um, if you're trying to boost the economy in the United States, uh, physics is not really that high on the list. Now, the, the smartest people I know are not physics professors. Uh, they, they, they're smart in a certain way, like a chess player may be smart, but you would never want to put a champion chess player in charge of your economy or your business. It's a very narrow kind of chess. They think they're the smartest people in the world, but they're not, not by far. Similarly, physics professors think they're the smartest people in the world. No, 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 no. There are all sorts of business people who are far smarter. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think they don't know any physics. Well, but still, I mean, it's, I don't think you have an excuse if you live on this planet for 80 years uh, that you don't have, you can't find time to to just kind of kind of read this book if not only out of just oh, no. curiosity, my books right? Are meant for those people. My my books are meant, I mean my, my if you want to get started there's another book I wrote which is called the instant physicists. Yeah, yeah. I just ordered it. I didn't realize. I just literally yeah, yeah. ordered it about an hour ago. Okay. This is a book that you give as Christmas presents to people. And what it, what it is is a uh, hundred anecdotes with with beautifully done uh, art by Joey Manfrey, and each one of them is a huh? You're kidding! It's sort of a believe it or not in in physics, you know, like the fact that to be legal for sale in the United States, wine must be radioactive. But they test it, and if it's not radioactive, 
they don't allow it. Imports that are not radioactive. So little anecdotes like that where people go, what? They can use them to win bar bets. <laughs> but but um, uh, it, 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 the idea here was to tickle your fancy and get you to want to know more. And that's what you can get from my other physics books. But I mean, if you're an ordinary voter and you're out there voting on things that are related to, say, you know, mandating recycling or um, supporting politicians that want to uh, impose uh, restrictions on, you know, fuel economy for cars and stuff. I mean, this presupposes that you have some capacity to understand and evaluate claims about things that are physics related. I mean, I just did a podcast recently where I said, you know, it's crazy that the majority of people in, say, Berkeley think that rent control is going to somehow solve that, the housing problem. I mean, this is just, you know, yeah. econ 101. Uh, and so um, is there like a physics 101 that, that a typical voter needs to have so that they can evaluate these? Well, there is. And that's what my books are about. Okay, so let me let me give a simple example. This is a thing that actually happened to me. So um, I was teaching a class. I had an office hour, and a woman came in who was in my class the previous semester. And she made a point of finding out when my office hours were. She had a story she had to tell me. She said last week she had dinner with her family, and they had a friend over who was a physicist at Livermore with more national laboratory. <clears throat> and he was telling them all about controlled thermonuclear fusion, how this is going to transform the world. And she knew a little bit about it because she'd taken my course, but mostly they were just speechless. And at the end of the talk, she said, she, she said to him, you know, um, I, I, I think solar power has a, has a future too. And he gave a classic physics Physicist response, which she described as he snickered. Uh, physicists are not very socially adept, typically. And he said to her, well, uh, look, if you want enough solar power just for California, you'd have to plaster, that's the term she said, the whole state with solar cells. And her response was, no, your numbers aren't right. There's a gigawatt of solar power in a square kilometer, and uh, California only uses 40 gigawatts, so it's really quite small. And she said his response was to look at her and was expressionless, and he was thinking. And then he said, well, your numbers don't sound wrong. I'm going to have to go back and look at this again. I tell this, this story to my class and say, yes, yes, this is what I want you to get from this class. The ability to shut up a know-it-all who, who hasn't done his homework, but thinks because he's a physicist that therefore things off the top of his head uh, should be listened to. So I want the future president when he's visited by his science advisor to be able to say, no, your numbers aren't right. There's a, there's a, 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 a gigawatt in a square kilometer. Uh, what you're telling me is wrong. That's what you need to know, not the ability to do integrals or solve difficult mathematical equations, but to sort of know what's going on in physics and, and technology. Yeah, I mean, I, I try to tell my MBA students that they should be armed with the kind of knowledge that would allow them to evaluate mm -hmm. claims, you know, empirical claims. You can look at a journal article in, in science or nature and evaluate, you know, p-values and stuff like that. But it seems like a lot of the stuff related to physics, I mean, you got to kind of trust the authorities, right? I mean, when you start talking about string theory, no, 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 I'm no, no, like, no, no. what? That's the last thing you want to do. String theory? Trust the authorities. <laughs> I mean, look, uh, uh, C.P. Snow, who, who, who said, you're not educated unless you understand the second law of thermodynamics. I believe he really misunderstood the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, you see this all the time in, in, the, in these movies like Jurassic Park, where you have this sententious mathematician who says, you can't control this because of chaos theory. And he's demonstrating his complete misunderstanding of chaos theory. 
uh, the second law of thermodynamics says things tend to chaos. They tend to randomness. And if that's the case, how can a chicken eat chicken feed and make an egg out of it? People always talk about you could bust the egg and see you can't put it back together again. Well, it turns out you can. You just feed that food to another chicken, or cannibalism, but forget that for the moment. And, uh, and the, the, the chicken will put it together into a highly organized being. So people totally misunderstand entropy. I try to straighten this out in my book now, where I correct people like Stephen Hawking, who gets it wrong, Eddington, who got it wrong. So many people get it wrong. Nobody wants to, to tell them they're wrong because they are heroes. But you, you, you can't let the public continue to be mis misled. So you want to be very careful. Even physicists get some of these things not right. You don't want to trust authorities, certainly not. Well, I think like this uh, Livermore scientist who learned solar was, was completely off scale. Well, in, in part, it's because, uh, I mean, authorities may have agendas and authorities may be overconfident and authorities may be put to use mm -hmm. by other parties. And I think the big issue of our day, or at least one of the big issues of our day, is is global warming. And it's kind of mm -hmm. astonishing to me how the debate over global warming has very little to do with the science. Right? It seems like uh, th there's all sorts of other motivations and reasons why one would line up on on one side or or the other. And you said that you you said that when you looked into you were, wanted to take a careful look at the data just to make sure that everything was good. Mm -hmm. People were saying, "Oh, you're a denier. You're you're a doubter, right?" When you were, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I have a long story with global warming. I eventually became a real expert on it. We put together a program called Berkeley Earth, which is now highly cited in the, by the by the UN committee, the IPCC, and is still is is in my mind the most objective analyst for global warming. But at the time we started this, the skeptics had some good points, and the advocates uh, were were often far off the signs. When someone says, just follow the science, and then they don't, how do you know? And they weren't. Same thing happened with, with COVID. Uh, people said, oh, look, just follow the sciences. There's a consensus here. And for one, there wasn't a consensus. And two, they weren't following the science. You know, the biggest skeptic on global warming of all time, the most famous one, is named Al Gore. How is he a skeptic? Well, he said the IPCC report is wrong. It's more dangerous than that. So if you say it's less dangerous than that, you say you're a skeptic. But if you say it's more dangerous than that, you're not a skeptic? No, he was one of the biggest skeptics of all time. And he also was wrong. Uh, so so we, I was a skeptic in the sense that I saw that the research that had been done was, <clears throat> to forgive the word, shoddy. Or maybe the research was good, but the articles were, were shoddy. I, I looked at them and I, I said, yeah, okay, what about this, this, and this? So by the time the research got into the public domain, which is where most people encounter it, that's when it kind of became shoddy or was the... No, no, before that. Before that. I mean, the, 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 the problem was the people doing the research were not being careful. I, I, I worry that they were driven by the fact that Global warming, they felt was real. They wanted to alert the public to this. If you told the public that in their lifetimes, the temperature had actually risen by three quarters of a degree, uh, that's not going to scare anybody. Now, global warming, in my opinion, is a real threat. But you can't, they felt you couldn't get the public on board by telling the truth. Telling the truth is a dangerous business. Um, and uh, so they found ways to state it that were very highly misleading, not always technically wrong. You know, they would say, and this Hurricane Katrina that just destroyed so much buildings and lives, and you expect more of them um, if, if, if you have global warming. And somehow thinking implying that Hurricane Katrina was due to global warming. 
and projections are that hurricanes are likely to get likely to go down in number. That's what the evidence shows. So they are misleading because of a good purpose. And they've lost their objectivity, which is what we tried to, uh, to, 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 to get back in our berkeleyearth.org. By the way, you can send the money at berkeleyearth.org. Uh, but also what I tried to do with my books, my, my physics for future presidents, my energy for future presidents. I became somewhat famous because I got this reputation for being objective. The idea that, uh, that, that there was an opening for objectivity in, in climate and energy and COVID science is, 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 is terrible. But I, I just jumped into these places and, uh, and got a reputation of being the one guy who's being objective. And, and, and I'm, I'm proud of that, but ashamed for my science. So you're, you're saying that if you deviate from this, this rigorous objectivity in, in the service of advancing an objective, however valid that objective is, it, it ultimately can backfire and uh, lead to that objective. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I look at today the respect that scientists hold in the public view, and it's much lower than it was when I was, when I was young. This is a long time ago because I'm getting up there in years. But science, I mean, science has lost its credibility largely due to two very important uh, stories. The first one is global warming, where so many scientists lost their objectivity. And the other was in the whole COVID story, uh, where, again, because these things are so important, scientists said, I can't be objective. They, they didn't say this out loud. They say, it's important for me to tell people what they should believe. I, I, I talked to a another professor once, I won't name who it was, <clears throat> and I told him how one of my proudest moments in teaching physics for future presidents, talking about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we're talking about bombs, and, and we're talking about global warming, and he came to my office hours and said, Professor Mullen, what are your politics? Are you Democrat, Republican, or independent? What are you? And my answer was, thank you, that's a fine compliment. Uh, if you can't tell, I am doing my job. I told this story to another professor, and he said he was horrified. He said, no, my job is to show them how to vote. And I was horrified at that. So I think scientists need to maintain their reputation or get it back as being one of the few disciplines from which you can get objective information. Okay, so what then do we know uh, with some degree of confidence about uh, global warming? Not only the extent to which it's happening, the extent to which it's uh, kind of anthropogenic. and yeah, okay. uh, Global warming is happening. It is real. Uh, temperature has risen in the last 150 years by one and a half degrees Celsius. One and a half degrees Celsius. It's real and it's caused by humans. And I believe, and this isn't science anymore, I believe it's a threat. Because I think if it keeps on going up like this, which it will, unless we have safe nuclear, cheap nuclear power, that if it keeps on going up like this, it is a threat. I also know from careful analysis that no major suggestions being made by Republicans or Democrats or anybody will work, even if implemented. That's the biggest problem. People are suggesting, oh, we should have a carbon tax, as if that'll solve the problem. I can argue effectively to say why it will not solve the problem. Uh, electric cars certainly won't solve the problem. Uh, I don't believe solar and wind have a chance of solving the problem. The, one, the, two, the two things we have that can solve the problem are higher efficiency, and that is really working well around the world. The efficiency is improving enormously. And the other is nuclear power, which we have to make cheaper than coal. And those will those can solve the problem uh, because you cannot cajole a poor person in a poor country to stop burning coal. Uh, they have problems of poverty, they have problems of hunger, problems of education. They can't turn their lights on at night to, to study uh, books because candles are too expensive. And so, so uh, they're not going to worry about global warming, especially because global warming is global and not local. 
and we can't solve global warming because we're only contributing 15% and our level hasn't been going up. And the, the most of it's coming from the developing world and will come from the de developing world. There's widespread belief in that. Everybody knows that to be true. They just don't say it. If you read the IPCC reports, you see it's inherent that global warming is coming from the developing world, not from the U.S. or Europe or the future global warming. So anything we do here, if we buy expensive EV cars, doesn't do any good. Well, we, I mean, we could go to zero emissions tomorrow, and it would only delay global warming by a few years. So the solutions, I know a lot of skeptics who are not skeptical about global warming, but they're skeptical about the proposed solutions, and correctly so. Now, these people who are skeptics about global warming, are they just uh, doubtful of the validity of the, the data, or are they saying that maybe some kind of, um, oh, I don't know, negative feedback will, will kick into the system and uh, kind of ameliorate the... Oh, I, I mean, I, I specialize in talking to uh, influential influence makers uh, who are skeptics on global warming. And for the most part, they are thoughtful and intelligent, and they make very good points that are not being addressed by the scientists of global warming. That's what we addressed when we did our studies, things such as the heat island effect, for which they were very sloppy, the, the data selection bias, which none of them address, um, uh, all, all sorts of, of, of issues that we address directly. And... I remember sitting in front of one very prominent person who was very skeptical, and I showed him the fit between carbon dioxide and, uh, and, 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 and a really good warming record that we had derived. And he, he looked at me and said, and how many parameters did you adjust? And I said, two. And he melted because he understood that, yeah, that's all I adjusted. I mean, part of the problem, of course, is that there are so many exaggerators out there. I mean, I remember a, a congresswoman who said that a global warming is here. I can feel it by the way the plane bounces around when I fly to Washington, D.C. And I go, I grill. Oh, the heat spell we had recently in, in California. Ah, global warming. If you listen carefully, you'll say this is the hottest heat spell in California in 90 years. Oh, so it was hotter 90 years ago? Well, that doesn't sound like global warming. And it isn't. It's just local climate. I mean, the temperature has gone up in my lifetime by almost a degree Celsius. How am I going to notice that? Individuals cannot notice global warming. Scientists can measure it and prove it's real, but they have to take hundreds of, hundreds of locations. I made a map, which I've published, it's in, it's in my book, one of my books, <laughs> a map of the United States showing which cities, which cities have had a temperature drop in the last 100 years. It turns out one third of them have. Two thirds of them have it going up. When you average it out, global warming is real. But if you're trying to say, oh, my city, I, I have the suspicion that all the global warming skeptics come from the cities where the local temperature has actually dropped over the last hundred years. It's a small but real effect, and yet nonetheless, in my mind, dangerous. Well, the reason to be concerned has less to do with the changes that have already happened, but the changes that we anticipate happening um, exactly. based, on, based on current exactly. trends, right? That's right. Yeah, and we know, I mean, we, we see the trends in carbon dioxide increase. I mean, China, a decade ago, was building one new gigawatt. That's a new, that's the size of a nuclear reactor plant, a coal-burning plant every week. And then they spent five years not burning it every week. They said, see, China's going along. Everything's okay. And then for the last two years, they've upped it up again. We're now building Two, for this, not 2024, they've been averaging two gigawatts of coal added every week. Why? Because their economy is in trouble. 
Yeah, and I think their output per dollar of GDP is much higher than that of, of the U.S. I don't care about output per GDP. I, I'm not looking to blame people. I'm just saying with I, I don't even want to blame China. I actually went over to China with a crew, with, a, with, with a, some tracking experts, to show them how to get natural gas because that's so much better than coal. But we, we, we need to help China make clean energy. And, and not tell them they got to start start using expensive energy. So, so the reason why you say carbon tax w would not work is uh, because presumably all the proposals are around domestic application. And even if the U.S. were to go to you know zero carbon tomorrow, it would not be sufficient to address the oh, carbon issue. tax would work. Okay, here's the problem, and they don't say this, but it's self evident as soon as I say it. The, the mechanism that carbon tax uses is to make dirty energy more expensive. More expensive than clean energy. So therefore, you will use the what was previously more expensive energy, which is now cheaper than the carbon tax energy. So, so your government has to be willing to oppose this. Now, they say it's cost neutral. That's not true. What it is is revenue neutral. The government takes its money and they invest it in other things. So they don't gain any money uh, as, if, as if the government can ever be revenue neutral. But to the consumer, it means an increase, car carbon tax means an increase in the cost of energy. Now, we can do that in the United States. We can do it in Europe. We can do it in Korea because we're wealthy countries. But is Bangladesh going to raise the cost of energy? in order to benefit not Bangladesh, but to benefit the whole world. This is there's a paradox of the commons that you probably know about, which is when, when you're sharing something, like we're sharing an atmosphere, there's a disadvantage to you making a sacrifice that when the main benefit is to everybody else and not, not focused in on you. So I don't think Bangladesh would ever impose a carbon tax. I don't think India would. They can't afford to. I don't... I don't think China would. They claim they're doing it because they have a very good PR organization and they choose a city, they impose a carbon tax, and they put on this demonstration. But but as long as they have trouble with their economy, they're not going to raise the cost of energy for the benefit of the United States. Well, in fact, there's plenty of countries that have what we might think of as carbon subsidies, right? Where <laughs> they're selling fuel below the cost of manufacture. I think Nigeria spends... Uh, that's know, right. A couple hundred That's bucks right. per person on this subsidy, and and they're afraid of riots That's if right. they were to uh, remove this. Well, well, subsidies make subsidies make sense to the extent that if you subsidize something, you create a market that wouldn't exist otherwise, and therefore there's competition, and people um, in competition bring the cost down. Well, no, I'm talking about That's subsidizing. That I've recently been. I'm talking. I'm talking about they subsidize gasoline and they subsidize. Um, they're not subsidizing clean energy. They're subsidizing dirty energy in, mm. in a lot of these countries, right? And, okay. So, okay. and so before we start talking about carbon tax, I mean, just getting it back to cost of production yeah. is going to be difficult in a lot of these countries. No, look, the poor countries, you can't expect them to do anything that is, is not for their own benefit. Well, wealthy countries can do that, but countries where the people are poor, we've got to subsidize mobility, uh, you have to subsidize electricity for lighting at night. They they have things that are more important to them than global warming, such as the health, the education, uh, all these aspects of uh, poverty, uh, hunger. Well, look, why doesn't solar solve this problem? I mean, we've seen the price of uh, PVCs go down Mm -hmm. Dramatically, mm -hmm. exponentially in the last uh, decade. I mean, it's 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 isn't it at the point where we can expect solar to re replace uh, thermal? Yeah, I, I or... had a conversation in Korea about this, and I'm saying it went down more than I expected. And the uh, uh, the, 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 the 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 president of their university, who I was having. Dinner with said, no, wait a minute, you predicted it in your book, Energy for Future Presidents. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, no, the price has gone down, but the trouble is you got to add in energy storage because the sun 
is not up all the time. You have the uh, sun not always out. It's certainly not out at night. It has a capacity factor of about uh, 30%, 25%, which means most of the time it's not delivering. So you have to add in the, the energy storage and uh, that drives the cost way up. That's usually not included in. Right, and well, people talk about, I mean, there's battery technology, which I think you, you point out has its, its limits. Um, but aren't there other ways to store energy? You know, these big, like, you know, geological batteries, right? Where you pump water up into there, there dams are, and, and yeah, so that's, forth. That's great science. And people are looking at it very hard. And right now, there's no universal way of doing it that is inexpensive. So yes, I mean, one of the areas that would be very important would be inexpensive energy storage. The best one is pumping water into a reservoir up in the mountains. And uh, Japan decided they didn't want to destroy their beautiful natural mountains in doing it this way. Other people don't have mountains. You can't do that in Bangladesh. Um, so, so yeah, there are ways of doing it that work for some people. People talk about tidal power, but the, the ability to get tidal power around the world is extremely limited, likewise for geothermal. Uh, I made the point in Korea that Korea, which claims it has no natural resources, is surrounded by the ocean. And the ocean, you can actually extract uranium from the ocean and make nuclear reactors based on that. So two-thirds, three-quarters, I think, of all the countries in the world have access to uh, to the oceans, and uh, and they could obtain uranium for nuclear power. And that, that gives not just energy security, but it gives energy independence. So those are two things that are important for many countries who are worried about energy independence. Well, at the end of the day, I mean, a lot of these choices and trade-offs are, are political, right? So a lot of the um, green energy is uh, going to run up against environmental objections. I, I was in uh, Chile uh, about a decade ago, and they wanted to build a gigantic um, power line from their sources of hydropower to the places where people actually lived. And there were huge environmental uh, objections to that. Uh, we know about windmills and everyone objects to them. I mean, President, former President Trump famously had a, a rant about uh, windmills, which was very, very entertaining. Um, and, uh, and then of course, we have this idea of energy independence, which is a, a political objective. So we see the Biden administration who has strongly supported move into green energy that has essentially imposed prohibitive tariffs on the importation of electric cars from from China and uh, has been trying to, you know, wean us off foreign sources of, of energy. So, I mean, those yeah, are political I don't, I don't call all that political. I don't call all that political. So, uh, having, losing an industry completely within your own country because China is subsidizing it is not a good thing to do for national security. And if you look at the way that China has become a bully recently, and they can get away with this because we're dependent on them, uh, and that, I don't call that politics. I, I call that um, world economics, world affairs, um, something like that. But So I, not all of these things are political. Some of them are. Uh, sometimes when you're you make an attack on an industry because it sounds good to people, that, that's certainly political. Well, I, I was using the political in the um, more neutral sense, right? <laughs> the word political has now become a curse word. I, I was meaning it in the sense that it's yeah, a question sure. of, of different competing priorities and different competing values where scientists can discuss the implications, but they can't provide some authoritative um uh, normative principle that would enable you to figure out as a country which is more important, right? Economic energy well, independence. Well, anybody else. Uh, uh, exactly. I, I mean, they can do it, but one should appreciate they don't have credentials or experience in that field. I uh, don't need to do a lot of people who pontificate on those subjects. So they're smart people, but they're not smarter than the typical businessman. And so, yeah, yeah if they can pontificate and if they make a good point, you should listen to it. 
but you should never accept them on their authority. Now, so you're working in the nuclear field, and I think there are a lot of people that are hesitant to consider nuclear uh, as an option. I mean, why haven't we? Uh, I mean, France was a big proponent of nuclear power for a long time. We in the U.S., we, we were building nuclear plants back in the—I used to I grew up in eastern Pennsylvania. There was this Three Mile Island thing. <laughs> I remember when the meltdown happened in my—I my, my, uh, guess it was in junior high school or high school. I mean— why hasn't nuclear taken off more than it has? Do we, do we overestimate the the risk of of meltdown? Oh, oh pe- people don't realize how much it has taken off in the last five years. When we are we are they, the nuclear renaissance is real and it's finally happening. And they remember things ten years ago, but many, if not most, environmentalists are now in support of nuclear power. There are a few outspoken ones that are not, <clears throat> the Union of Concerned Scientists, or a few others. But for the most part, nuclear is really taking off. I mean, the recent bill, they said a bill, a very pro-nuclear power bill that just passed Congress, and it passed the Senate by a vote, get ready for this, 88 to 2. This is called the Advance Bill. You could look it up. It's basically to try to spur rapid development of small-scale, small-modular nuclear reactors, 88 to 2. And, and the, the, in the House, it was a similar, I think it was 97% of the votes in the House. President Biden come at, came out and he says nuclear power has to triple in the United States and in the world by 2050. Um, uh, Trump has been always been in favor of nuclear power. It's really, really changing. And you can look at polls. There, the the Bank of America took a poll recently that showed that support of nuclear power in the United States has grown enormously. Now, why didn't it grow previously? Well, part of it was that certain groups discovered that it was easier to frighten people about nuclear power than it was to frighten them about almost anything else. So, France, they went ahead with nuclear power, as they used to say. They said, no coal, or no oil, or no choice. But in the United States, we're wealthy, and we have lots of coal, and we have lots of oil, and, and so we could, we could do it. And the people who argue, be scared of nuclear power, uh, could, could do that. The politicians were scared of being hit with questions about nuclear power because it was highly technical and they didn't have answers. And the last thing a politician wants to say is, yeah, I don't agree with that. Here, let me let, me let my science advisor uh, ad- address that issue. You know, they have to be ready. So the fact that it was technical put them at a disadvantage. And as a result, uh, we, we could afford not to go nuclear. So for the scientists who are um, concerned about global warming and who want to do something about it, um, if I mean, how many of how many of them are support in support of nuclear power development? I mean, what would the alternative our be? Objective. Would the alternative be to simply, uh, I don't know, go back and live like our ancestors? I mean, what what, what what's the alternative? I mean, you're asking me to support a position that I consider unreasonable, and you're saying, what would the scientists who oppose nuclear power say? And typically, what they say is change the lifestyle of everybody in the world. To, to, to live uh, more frugally and, and not depend on, on energy. And, and, and this is really a scientist talking about things about which he or her really doesn't understand. The idea that, oh, just get everybody in the world to change their lifestyles. Yeah, they should stop eating meat. Um, I, mean, I mean, I was down in, 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 in Paraguay and it turns out the staple of the diet is meat, not vegetables. It turns out meat is easier to raise than vegetables. You just let those cattle roam on the fields and they grow themselves. Agriculture is expensive and difficult. So uh, the, the sort of glib things they say are way out of their field. Now, what about this? Uh, I've, I've heard a lot of talk about things like, like hydrogen. Um, as a, as an alternative uh, fuel source, yeah. particularly for motor vehicles. Okay, hydrogen 
could replace batteries for, for motor vehicles when it comes to that. The problem with hydrogen is this. Suppose you have uh, a kilowatt hour of energy you put into making hydrogen. Then you put that hydrogen into your car and ask how much energy do you get out to run the wheels? And the answer is 0 0.4 kilowatt hours. You lose 60% of the energy in the process of making the hydrogen and then of converting it to electricity back in the car. And that's assuming that you're using a very expensive fuel cell to create the energy in the car. If you do it by just burning the hydrogen, you don't even do that well. So the, the problem is one of cost. And I think hydrogen has a future. Once we can get the cost of nuclear power, to use an old phrase, to the point where you no longer have to meter the electricity. That's what we're trying to do with our company. Now, one last question about energy. I have a friend who actually went to Berkeley um, Engineering, and she is now working for this fusion company up in uh, Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, you've probably heard of it. Um, gotten a bunch of funding. Now, it, you know, when I think people hear about fusion, they think it is some kind of perpetual motion machine. Um, is is fusion a, a realistic possibility? In well, fusion was a big hit twenty years ago uh, for several reasons. They said we're not going to run out of uh, out of hydrogen from the oceans, uh, so they, from, you know, from from water, and therefore uh, unlimited. You know, then in the nineteen eighties, people discovered we have lots of uranium. What we don't have is ultra cheap uranium. So you want to start a uranium company, you're not going to be able to compete with the cheap uranium, particularly these days uranium that was coming from Russia. But there's a huge amount of uranium there and an infinite amount if we get our uranium from seawater. And there are some, there's, a, uh, there's some uh, Battelle and Japan at the research program to get uranium out of seawater. Now the biggest demonstration project is being run by China, of all places, in the South China Sea, they're extracting uranium. So we're not going to run out of uranium. That was the first argument for fusion. We're not going to run out of hydrogen fuel now, but that 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 goes away. They said there's no problem with nuclear waste. Well, there's no problem with nuclear waste either. That's a solved problem. Uh, we're putting nuclear waste in an underground facility uh, called uh, in, in, in in New Mexico, uh, there is. Uh, I have a company that will put nuclear waste in a um, in a borehole a mile deep. That's what it actually inspired my nuclear reactor in a borehole a mile deep, and which all came out of my interest in fracking and knowing knowing a lot about boreholes. So there's really no nuclear waste problem anymore. If you put the nuclear waste a mile deep, uh, it. it by the time it reaches the surface, which is two or three million years from now, the level is still well below what we consider much lower than, than, than need be. And, and that, that also assumes that a million years from now, we will not have cured cancer. So there's no problem with the waste. So that value goes away. The problem is that nuclear power, I mean, fusion isn't working yet. Whereas nuclear fission is, and uh, I was the I was on the scientific advisory board of the fusion project for the Lawrence Livermore project, and every year they came out with an announcement about how this will become commercial nuclear power. And every year I came out with a um, a, a, a statement that uh, I disagree with them <laughs> that they're. <clears throat> Their, their laser system would never lead to commercial nuclear power. Well, I want to turn now to this book, uh, Physics of Time, now the Physics of Time. Um, this seems to be a little bit more difficult to grasp and understand than the other uh, areas of, of physics that you discuss in your other books. So what's, what's remarkable about this book, I mean, there's a couple things, but first of all, is just how amazing it is that people like Einstein could solve these mysteries and come up with these theories, you know, more or less without all of the tools and technologies that we have today. I mean, and just the sheer number of 
insights that one guy like Einstein, I mean, you talk about Boltzmann, you talk about Planck, you talk about all of these other folks, but, but I mean, you just keep coming back to Einstein. I mean, the guy was man of the century, right? Uh, but according to Time Magazine, well, well, de well deserved. <laughs> Ironically, Time Magazine, yeah. Can only, I mean, it will, I, it's highly unlikely we'll ever have another single human being who is capable of that much discovery in a single lifetime. Oh, I think we had several. Well, Enrico Fermi made more discoveries than Einstein did. Not as well known, but but certainly, oh, I mean, unbelievable things. I mean, I, you can exaggerate Einstein, and people do, because because in 1920, when Eddington verified Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, uh, he was really played up, sort of like. Elon Musk is being played up today, or Steve Jobs was some time ago. Here is the great genius, uh, or yeah. Uh, so 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 uh, Einstein was amazing as a theoretical physicist. I I, I wrote an essay once called "The Gift of Time," and I, I thanked Einstein for turning time from being the background of a play, which everything occurs with time just going on, to making time itself a subject of study. But even he had problems with understanding the motion of time. That was, that was, that was something that he expressed difficulty doing, and, uh, and, and a lot of people don't know that. And people like Eddington and Hawking come in and they say, oh, we now understand it is this and this and this, and they're just completely wrong. Well, I have to admit, I, I certainly have a hard time understanding it. I had dinner last night with my, my cousin and I told him that, you know, all of that frequent flying that he was doing back and forth across the Pacific <laughs> meant that he was going to live a few nanoseconds longer. <laughs> <laughs> but he won't experience a few nanoseconds more. He'll, he'll, he may outlive you, but he'll still live the same amount of time himself. Subjectively, but he'll, won't he be able to see a few more nanoseconds of his grandchildren you know, on the back end? Oh, that's true. That's true. Well, I have to say that even, even though these were some of the best explanations that I've ever encountered about, say, the, the twin paradox or the pole in the barn paradox or the, the tachyon mm. murder. Um, I have to say, I'm still a little <laughs> per, perplexed by, by this. Um, but, but well, it, that's because of your elementary school teachers who told you, look, time is absolute. If, when you, I say you should do this by now, you should do it by now. And, and so you're taught from the beginning that time is absolute. It's the most absolute thing in the world. Uh, but uh, I, 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 there's so many things now that I believe in. For example, I was taught by my elementary school teacher that the word he means male or female. When you say he did it, male or female. Why do I believe that? It turns out because my third grade teacher told me that. I, I got to go back and re-examine, wait a minute, what, was she really a super expert in this? Is she, has she studied the English language and seen how it's used? So you were told by, by your teachers and your parents probably at time is absolute. That's why it's so hard for you. That's why it was so hard for Einstein to convince people that what he was doing uh, made sense. Yeah, I, I loved you had a little rant buried somewhere in the book about um, how scientists think that they own terminology, right? And they can oh, tell yes. everybody, you know, what words mean and, and so forth. But how have we kind of, altered our understanding of the world as a result of this discovery of, of, of time. I mean, you, you said that in Einstein's oh. article, he said he started off with this super little childlike example of, well, two things happen at the same time based on your watch. And you know, oh, that, let me give you a quick, a, a simple example of when you look at your cell phones to see where you are, they're communicating with satellites. Now, if they didn't take special and general relativity into account, you'd be off by miles in your location. They have Einstein's equations built into them. So when they send you a signal, they send you not only the signal, but they send you their velocity and their height. And your little GPS receiver takes that into account and calculates 
how to compensate for that to get you your correct position. So we use this every day. And it's, it's, it's Einstein relativity. And I like to imagine if Einstein had never come up with it, what a mystery it would have been when people started creating something like GPS and found it didn't work and tried to track it down. And they would have a really confusing time. But now they just automatically build it in. Right. And so if you were building out GPS systems using Newtonian physics, it would be wildly off, off base. It would be wildly off. No, you would... I mean, you're carrying general relativity in your pocket, and most people don't know that. Well, just like they don't, they don't, they don't know what the integrated circuit technology is like either. They don't know about the battery technology, but the fact that it uses Einstein's special and general relativity, I think, comes as a bigger surprise to them than the fact that they're using some mysterious uh, battery technology or or, or glass that that doesn't smudge or whatever. Well, and I think you said somewhere that um, when a new theory is introduced, it, it, has to, it has to encompass the old theory, right? So, so Newton's theories work more or less within a certain subset of circumstances. And for most of what humans were doing, yeah, it right. didn't really matter, right? You know, you were... That's right, that's right. Now, if you're hitting a baseball, you don't have to know that F equals MA. But the fact is, the old theory was strongly supported by uh, experiment. And so if you have a new theory, you have to be able to explain all of those old experiments and then simply say, if we're now in a new realm where the ball you're batting is a photon and it's going at the speed of light, which was never tested for Newton's theory, and Newton's theory would predict the wrong answer, now you get that correct also. As well as, so there's something called the correspondence principle, which is that in the realm in which Newton's theory was invented and tested, that your new theory has to still account for that, 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 that special and general relativity, when you get down to low velocities or small gravitational fields, that you will still have something that looks like F equals MA. Now, I think what a lot of people are surprised by is how deeply connected all of the work that goes on involving stars and galaxies, how they relate to the stuff that you do, which is more at the microscopic level, right? So I think you said that the, the, the device that you've been working on is like three inches long and you can uh, derive all sorts of insight from, from these tools. That, does it surprise you that, that the microscopic and the macroscopic can, can inform each other in this way? Oh, I I don't know whether something I became aware of 40 years ago can should, should be characterized as surprising me. Uh, did it surprise me? I mean, I mean, so much of nuclear physics was derived by Beta, Hans Beta, trying to understand how the sun can keep on burning. I mean, the, the, the idea was if you took the most efficient fuel you had and you filled the sun up with it, it would burn out after a few million years, and yet there was strong evidence that the Earth was billions of years old. How could that be? So uh, understanding nuclear physics goes way back then. The Big Bang Theory was explaining where all the nuclei came from. What is it that produced helium? Uh, the, 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 the theory of, of beta on uh, production of iron and carbon uh, we're all based in the sun. The history of astrophysics and particle physics goes way back. And in terms of being a good physicist, what kinds of characteristics do you think you need? I mean, is are they similar to the characteristics that you need to be a good researcher in, in other disciplines? Um, you know, curiosity, capacity for abstract thinking, Oh, it's not curiosity. Now, scientists are not driven by curiosity. Now, if, if, if you're driven by curiosity, you spend your entire day in the library reading books. Okay, that's curiosity. Scientists, it's more of a challenge, of an adventure. It's what drove uh, the early explorers in the 1600s to go and find a new world, maybe with gold in them. 
you, you, the whole idea of having an adventure is why you go into science, not out of a curiosity. Curiosity, there's so many things that I still don't know as an individual. And if I spend all oh, five years as I, as I did trying to find out what, whether the universe is expanding slower than it used to, what do I get out of all that work? One fact. I can get one fact in five minutes at the, at, at the library. I could probably get 10 facts I didn't know in the library. Just read about some country I don't know about. I, if I'm curious, uh, read, 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 read. But if you want the adventure, uh, if you want to be the first person to do something, uh, the first person to understand that there is dark energy. I got an award for my role in discovery of dark energy. Completely surprising, completely amazing. Uh, not completely unexpected, because if you look at Einstein's theory, it fits in very naturally. But Einstein himself abandoned the term. Uh, but, uh, but, but that sense of adventure, the thrill of discovery, that's what you get. You don't satisfy curiosity. Well, last question. You know, you write these books for future presidents um, in the hopes that they'll remember some of it. Do you think that um, in at the level of public decision making, we need to have more scientists? I mean, you look at Congress, it's filled with lawyers, maybe a couple business people. You don't see a lot. Of, I think there's only one PhD in the whole no. of Congress. I mean, or if not at the level of decision making, there was um, a movement uh, a couple of years ago to make sure that every piece of legislation um, was examined for cost benefit analysis. And that meant that you had all these economists that were out there That's doing right. the cost benefit. Do, do you think we should have some okay. kind of similar uh, science review so that the some scientists? Yeah, I, I think Congress is smart enough that they actually do that. I know the person who had the role on nuclear issues of uh, examining every bill that was to be passed to make sure it was consistent with what we knew about nuclear nuclear issues. Uh, so there, there is some of that going on. But I think you don't just, you can't just depend on one science advisor who may have an agenda, particularly if he was picked because he supported you in the election. Uh, you, you, you need to have more of a general education so you can say, no, your numbers aren't right. If uh, uh, California only has 40 gigawatts and uh, you get a gigawatt from a square kilometer of solar cells. So we need to have that general education so that when a scientist is presenting you with BS, you, as a non-scientist, can recognize it. And what about filmmakers? I think you you reference a lot of films and novels in, in your work. Talk about Dune and you know Foundation and so forth. I was surprised at how um, how many of these filmmakers actually seem to care <laughs> about the extent to which they're. Um... Oh, some of them do, and some of them don't. I, I, I prefer the movies in which they depict a black hole in a way that actually makes sense. Uh, I, I, would, I, I used to offer a service to my students that I could explain the physics of most science fiction movies. So people would say, well, a, a lifesaver can't be light because it stops. And I said, oh, that's interesting. So a light bulb can't be a light bulb because the brightest part just stops. And, you know, no, I, 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 Star Wars, I have no trouble. Gravity in space? How come people can walk around in spaceships and feel gravity? Well, come on, this is the future. And uh, any rocket ship that's going on for a long time, they put a slight 1G transverse acceleration uh, so that they will feel at home and they don't have to be weightless. So I've explained this role that there's, but generally speaking, I like science fiction. I enjoy science fiction. Well, Richard, thanks so much for joining me. Um, everybody really ought to check out these books, Energy for Presidents, Future Presidents, Physics for Future Presidents, maybe for past and present presidents as well. They can buy the book. And uh, and this one, the the physics of now, the, the physics. And also the instant physicists, which is a great stocking stuffer. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time, right? Thanks so much. Uh, we'll talk again soon. Okay, good. Good talking with you. Bye-bye. 
Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution.